Uh, I cannot name the person that I discussed with. My discussion was about the possibility of raising one trillion US dollars, right? And uh, the answer that I got was from from Thomas said that that's not a problem at all. With Singapore's triple A financial, brother, we brother, can, we can mobilize any amount of money. The, the, the only issue is do we have enough people or cap capable people or trustworthy people who know how to use the money effectively? So this is the critical problem. So it's a, it's, it boils down to the mindset problem. Unless we have a new generation of young people or, or, or older people who are capable of mobilizing uh, capital and technology and working with the Southeast Asian counterparts, we are going to be uh, a bit behind time. So this is the, the, the question, right? So the, the speakers that we have uh, 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 brought together, like for example, Mr. Balji, uh, it would be very important for him to talk about how, how, do you, how does the media, right? The newspapers, the, 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 the electronic media and so on, how do we use the media to kind of reopen the Singaporean mind, right? It's, it's really the issue is mind versus media. Okay, then we have uh, Melvin Tan who will be talking about the, the the Swiss model because one of the propositions we we put forward in the last session is that Singapore's uh, five uh, community development councils should be turned into five uh, local governments. That means there will be five HDBs, five uh, URAs, five uh, MOEs, and let them uh, decide uh, on their own what sort of policy they want to exercise and let them compete with each other who can do better. And then I have um, Mr. Uh, Yi Jen Yong, um, who is going to talk about uh, at the grassroots level, at the operational level in the community, you know, what actually happens? How do you, how do you get people to come out of, the, of their shell and to think uh, creatively? Uh, then I have, uh, we have Koo Sui Yong here, who is a real estate expert, right? Uh, he and I have, and together with Yu Lam Kiong, has worked on a, a proposal about how we can uh, 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 change the financial model of the HDB, particularly for the young people, so that they, the young people don't get into a debt trap. Because once they are in the debt trap, right, they have to pay huge amounts of money to to uh, to own their flat, right? They will be very afraid to do anything, right? And then, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, Who's the other person? Uh, yeah, and 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 also, if Han Shi can join us and make some comments about the Hong Kong situation, that will be very very helpful, to, uh, uh, Han Shi. Yeah. So thank you all very much. Uh, 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 please, uh, please uh, kick off with uh, Balji. Yeah, okay. I'm also very I'm also very interested in uh, listening to Sui Yong. Yeah. Okay, Sui Yong. I Mel Melvin should go first. Uh, it's okay, lah. <laughs> because people asking for you specifically. It's fine, it's fine with me. Hero, la. You hero. Where? <laughs> okay. In that case, let me make the point sharper and sweeter. I've got <laughs> four slides. Four slides to share. Okay. All right. So this is slide number one. Just imagine a couple buying a four hundred thousand dollar HDB flat. And my scenario is pretty um, uh, conservative that they already have 10% cash for the down payment, yeah. which is $40,000. And they use 20% CP, 20 uh, so they, they paid a total of 30%, which is $120,000 towards the purchase of a $400,000 HDB flat. So husband and wife probably are about 30 years old today. They take on a 25-year loan. So on the graph, you will see that they are at 30 years old. They then pay the loan until they are they then pay the loan until they are 55 years old. Mm -hmm. And they have used 80,000 of CPF at the start. So I'm now calculating how much CPF they would have withdrawn over the next 25 years to pay this home loan, which is about $1,500 a month. So it's between husband and wife. 
in the 25 years up until they are 55 years old, assuming that they remain um, uh, cash fluid, uh, CPF fluid, I mean, in between, you could lose your jobs for a few months. You still have a bit of reserves in the CPF to continue paying. So 25 years of payment of CPF monthly plus the initial withdrawal of 80,000 from the CPF, you have lost $206,000 of interest that CPF would have paid the husband and wife. This is the power of compounding. So you withdrew from your CPF ordinary account to pay for your HDB. And then during these 25 years, CPF didn't have to pay you a total interest of 206000 This would have been money that if they had not purchased a HDB flat, if this married couple, say, would have stayed with their parents in a big house and, and then have children, they, they would have earned this 206000 by keeping the CPF money there. Okay, so it's not a small sum of money. At age 55, their CPF would then be uh, Let changed. me interject. What is the interest rate that you are using to calculate this? Here, I use a flat rate of 2.5% across the 25 years. Mm. If this couple had borrowed from HDB, in fact, they would be paying 2.6%. So the interest foregone would be a little bit more. Uh, if they had borrowed from the banks, uh, some years they would be paying less than 2.5%. Some years they might be paying more than 2.5%. Like today in a higher interest rate environment, they would probably be paying 3.5%. So I'm using a flat 2.5%. Okay. Okay. So the interest foregone is significant. It's 200,000 that would have been theirs for retirement. But don't forget that they also have locked up 400 over 1,000 of CPF in the HDB flat. So not only did they forego 206,000, the blue line shows how much they have withdrawn as a couple, which is over 440,000. So that's 600 over $1,000 that would have helped contribute to their retirement uh, when they can withdraw the cash partly from age 55 and subsequently when the CPF life pays out to them at age 65. Okay, so the next slide is uh, my friend and my ex-student, uh, Mr. Justin Chong. He's a TikToker and he recently shared this on his TikTok. Um, to, to sort of highlight the accrued interest that we would have earned if we have left our money in the, in the CPF rather than put our money into a property. So he used an example of a person who has bought sort of uh, 20, almost 30 years ago, bought a flat. At that time, was about $400,000. And he and his wife, he, he's the main contributor to the repayment of the flat. But the wife has also used some CPF money. But he has withdrawn 355000 over this 20-something um, year period. And his total accrued interest is 240000 So the 240000 is interest that he failed to earn. And the 355000 is money that he withdrew from his CPF to pay for the HDB flat, which cost him 400000 And that 355000 included the bank interest charges. So can you see that by owning a HDB flat from when you are about 30, 35 years old, you have locked yourself in into, well, Prof Day calls it a debt trap, but uh, to me, it is just a pair of handcuffs that for the husband, <laughs> he has withdrawn 355000 paying interest as well as paying towards the value of the HDB flat, and that he also failed to earn 240000 which would be helping him to enjoy his post-65-year-old lifestyle. Now, we are now coming to a head where, 
we we are not even questioning what is the valuation of the HDB flat today because in both these examples, the previous slide as well as this slide, we are talking about HDB flats that have depreciated a further 25 years. So these HDB flats may be now at a 70 years left on the lease, or it could be 60, 60 something years left on the lease. What is the value of these flats at this period? When you are about to retire, what is the value left over? Should you be trying to downsize? And in the meantime, you have already lost this money that you should have earned if you have kept the money in the, the, the CPF instead of taking it out to fund your housing. Now, two more slides. We This is our population demographics, not in the Buddha head uh, <laughs> version, because that one is a, is a male versus female. I combine male versus female and then I put it on its side. So this is Singapore plus Singapore PRs in the year 2020. And then I group them by generational cohorts. Baby boomers are in that category with the red uh, outline. You will see that over the next 20 years, the Gen Z will move to, towards the right. The Gen Y will move towards the right. And you see that that's where our population is at sort of its peak. And that number is 300,000. And each bar is five-year cohort, which means that each year is about 60,000 people. But I summarize, huh? from the year 2021, every year there will be at least 50,000 people celebrating their 65th birthday, which is when they withdraw from CPF. They are celebrating, there's 50,000 people celebrating 65th birthday. But since more than 10 years ago, our birth rate has, our number of births per year has been at 30 something thousand. So if you look, if you shifted this whole population pyramid a little bit 20 years to the right. You see that the Gen Z today who are starting to contribute money to the CPF versus the number of baby boomers and the Gen X who are now going to start withdrawing from CPF. The contribution to CPF versus the withdrawal and redemption from CPF. And the redemption is big if somebody actually passes away today. A baby a high-earning baby boomer who is passing away today who may have 300,000 left in his CPF would be an immediate one-shot withdrawal of $300,000. Whereas a Gen Z that is about to start on his career, earning $3,000 a month would only be contributing $1,000 or, or less of CPF every month. So the, the contribution to CPF funds versus the redemption of CPF funds as this big bulge of PRs and Singaporeans start to pass on, and not just passing on, but once you are post 65, you are starting to withdraw money from your account. This. Uh, Su Yong, Su Yong, sorry. Uh, cut in. Uh, can you hear me, right? Mm. So, uh, forgive me, uh, but i a little bit confused. Uh, my understanding is after you turn 65, you cannot draw the remainder of your CPF out. There's something called CPF Life. So you have to put aside certain amount to this insurance, which now the government also want to budge in. Uh. So uh, are you correct in saying that, you know, you can, anybody who turns 65 now can take out the remainder of their uh, retirement? No, 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 account? no. no. Um, you are correct. At 65 years old, we are withdrawing month by month. Ah. Yes. But, but not how many some. people are at 65 years old withdrawing month by month? compared to how many people are in the Generation Z category starting to contribute to CPF. So as a pot of funds that CPF board is managing, the redemption is increasing on a monthly basis because there are so many people getting past the 65-year mark now. And the number of young people contributing new fresh money into the pot is smaller and smaller. And anybody who is passing away 
uh, in fact, at any age, if I pass away today, uh, my whole chunk of CPF money would be withdrawn from my beneficiaries also. And so the redemption versus contribution is something that we have to co be concerned about now. Plus, then we overlay this situation with the aging 99-year lease of our HDB flats that's depreciating in value. So we see that this situation and this situation is actually a double whammy on many of our lower income families, lower income and older families. So this is just the last slide that I wanted to share tonight that summarizes that from the year 2021 for a continuous 40 years, there will be more than 50,000 Singapore residents celebrating 65th birthday every year. This statement just to highlight that there's going to be quite a lot of demand for redemptions on CPF monies. And we should start showing concern and planning our, our finances more carefully because I am quite sure that within the next 10 to 20 years, there will be even more tweaks to the CPF system that may delay some of these redemptions. Okay, that's all from uh, me. Okay, so Yong, uh, we have a question for you from mm -hmm. a participant, name is Lee So Gyok. So she disagree and say that we can't just look at the lease decay because there's something called an annual housing cost. Uh, AHC will grow proportionally to income. This is what she wrote. Uh, AKA the price of HDB with remaining 10 to 20 year lease will still be higher than the original BTO price, which is 99. You can see her question in the chat. Or would you prefer she asked in person? Ah, it's okay. Um, I am using uh, an old uh, example. This example that I'm using is somebody who has bought his BTO somebody who has bought his uh, flat about 27, 28 years ago. Um, this chart that I'm using, I'm assuming that somebody is buying their flat at $400,000. Today's BTO, four-room flat, there are very few that starts at $400,000 already. So, of course, what Sogyok has mentioned, I mean, that there's an entire range of people who have bought their HDB flats at below $100,000 that's still existing today. So I we, we can't generalize enough to cover the extreme ends. But think about those who are staying in Commonwealth Crescent, those who are staying in Topayo, Lorong 1, Lorong 4. Generally, the poorer, lower income and in, in that era of uh, baby boomers, generally on, only one breadwinner, the other one is a house make, homemaker. And so they are reserves. And now they are in a HDB flat that is 50 years old, left with 49 years on the lease. Um, they're not sure whether there will be enough buyers who will be able to help buy out their HDB flats at still a profit. And then subsequently, where do they move to anyway? Um, it is I, a, can relate, yeah, I can relate from my own personal experience. Lah. Because uh, my family, my dad and I, we used to stay in Holland Drive, uh, Block 22. And we were marked for SIRS. So my dad got a flat in the Commonwealth Avenue, Tangling Hawk area. So we downgraded from five-room to four-room flat. So when he purchased the original Holland Drive flat, it was 1972. And he only, uh, I remember 1972 because he bought it at, at 72000 So that was a very low price back then. Uh, and because it was SERS and downgrading, the government actually compensated by giving him a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but the worth of the Tangling Hawk flat today uh, is around 400, 450,000. So you can see he actually make money, la, but he's 83 years old. So he's considered a silent generation. So there are people in the SERS group who actually benefited. Uh, but as you say, it's a very small proportion. No, so Yong, uh, what you are saying is that the the the, the HDB uh, home ownership sales program is actually a handcraft, right? It's a handcraft, handcuff, right? Yeah. Now, what is your view 
what my, I, I think the general view of most people is that hopefully they will be able to sell their, their XDB flat for a huge profit, okay? Um, so will that make a big difference to the to the model that you have shown that, that there is a flaw in the existing model, okay? That's why the handcuff, right? So given the fact that uh, after the 50 year stage, the, there is a, there's a, a decline in the value of the flat, obviously the government knows this and therefore they will, they will increase the lease. And given the fact that uh, there are going to be a lot more foreigners, maybe from China coming to buy flats here, they will encourage that. So a $50,000 flat or $60,000, $600,000 flat may, the flat owner right now expects that he will be able to sell it for over a million dollars in time. Is that a reasonable assumption? That assumption is reasonable. The next person who buys it better be a very rich person because the next person then would be using his cash and CPF and he's buying at a million dollars, meaning he'll probably borrow at least $700,000 and then he would be using he's CPF. He's not going to, to use pay. CPF. He's got a lot of spare cash coming in from some other place, right? And, okay. and, and Singapore yeah. is attracting this kind of people, right? Because they want Singaporean to be Singapore to be a kind of Zurich, right? So, so property ownership is one form of of uh, asset value sequestration. Okay. So, if I'm a China person just becoming a new Singaporean and a new PR, and then yeah. I have a million dollars to buy an old HDB flat from you. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't I use that $1 million and buy something that is $1.5 million that is a private 99-year leasehold? Why do I want to buy a second-hand HDB with so little lease left plus under no, no, the no, restriction no, no, no. of the... the, the my, 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 my surmise is that the government will simply increase the lease. It okay. will not be a, a decreasing lease. There will be another 99 years. Okay, then, because then that they need to protect the existing value. Yes, yes. Okay. Then that protects the housing value. It still doesn't protect my CPF retirement and withdrawal unless I'm one of the lucky ones who managed to sell. Right. So that is then, the expectation. That is the people's expectation, which yeah. uh, will benefit the government so long as this expectation is maintained which means that this becomes a Ponzi sort of scheme. We kick the can down the road to the next generation. I won't use the word Ponzi, la, but I think that this is a, it's called a management of expectations. Okay. Okay. Please, Melvin. Okay, so this, this issue of property and, uh, and savings and all that is a particularly important issue uh, when we compare, contrast this with uh, earlier statement by uh, uh, by JJ, uh, Jian Jiong, about volunteerism, right? About the older people, right? Volunteering in, in doing social work and so on and so forth. They can do so, so long as they believe that their asset, right, will be able to sustain their volunteerism. But if their asset is a depreciating asset, then, you know, volunteerism is a, is a, is a, is, is a dead end. Correct. Okay, who's next? <laughs> uh, Melvin? Melvin is next. 